Welcome back to uh, BLB, and today we have our guest Mick Harvey in, and we heard a uh, track then, for, the track one from Mick's new album, Sketches from the Book of the Dead, which he's launching on Saturday night at the Tote. Toff. 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 <laughs> Hello, at the Toff in, in town. town. Sorry, Mick. I got it. <laughs> well, you said Tote before, so I thought... I see. I thought, did I? Did I say yeah, Tote? Yeah, but it's the Toff in town, that'd be good. So you've been playing with uh, Rosie Westbrook on bass, who yep. plays on the album, and... Any other of the players on the album uh, making the gig at the top? J- JP Shiloh okay. will be joining me there. He's mm-hmm. not generally travelling with yeah. me all the time. He's yeah. a man in great demand. Yes. He seems to be in about 20 bands. Mm. But he will be there on uh, Saturday night. I He's think uh, Mark Dawson might even be sitting in for a oh, few good. songs on the on the battery. <laughs> yeah. No, right, yeah, JP Shiloh's like a new one-man Melbourne Mafia, <coughs> as they used to call Oh, let's not go the there, Dave. Three, yes. <laughs> <coughs> let's not go there, yeah. No, don't go there. Now, October Boy is a, uh, from my uh, uh, limited reading of things, is a, a, a Roland S. Howard kind of uh, song, because when, when he was a... Uh, young fella he he took his birthday was in october and he took the october sign from a bank thing and and plugged that's it, right i think katie, it on his, i think on his katie jacket. Might, my wife might even have had a photo of him mm-hmm. wearing that badge i think that's where it comes from yeah it but i mean it's opt- the song is uh the mm. song is quite um deliberately um uh, discernible that's mm. about yeah. Roland, whereas the other songs on the album are not uh yeah at all really clear who they're about at least not to people who don't know the people involved but he, he asked you to write a song he about did him. in fact as yeah. A, yes yeah that's good so, that line in the song so yeah it's all kind of a twist on that i suppose and mm-hmm. trying to uh incorporate some of his black humor mm-hmm. back on himself or something it's yeah. you know it's meant light-heartedly and kind of in um you know lovingly yeah, it's not uh, <clears throat> uh, attempting to, you know. Kind of, I didn't want to kind of wallow in uh, sure. in grief or anything, Dave. I'm yeah. sure you wouldn't have been able to stand that. <laughs> yeah. <for>. So, uh, <laughs> was Roland's passing the inspiration to write a whole album about? No, death? no. And then the, the reason, um, you know, I'm able to quote that in the chorus is because. Uh, he, I had talked to him about the fact that I was halfway through writing the album, so, uh, and he said, well, then, then write one for me. Mm. And I sort of looked at him and thought, you know, you're not dead, mate. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But, you know, I, um, yeah, well, anyway, it stayed with me, so then I thought, oh, well, mm. I better do it now. <clears throat> Must have been quite the- po- poignant, you know, in a, in a, in a humorous way, like you say. I didn't quite know how to take it. Yes, sure. Time to <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, most of the rest of the songs on the album really are, are not about more uh, recent departures. They're more about uh, long, long gone people mm. in a way. Yeah, much more so. That's the, the sort of <clears throat> the thrust of the album is really kind of investigating, uh, you know, fragmentary memories and lost. Uh, Lost connections, and things that are still with you in a way, misremembered yeah. things, yeah, yeah. And mythical all that sort of things. stuff, and it's really long away from any kind of immediate loss or sadness or grieving process. It's really not the album's really not about that sort of thing at all. But then, when you bring it out, do you have you had to, uh, you know, uh, talk with people who who might be directly, you know, involved in <clears throat> the songs and people you're singing about? Oh, just my mum, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you have to, do you my, have to explain it in a way? Yeah. Uh, Say, so, you know, if I got it wrong, it's just what I remember. That's right. That's, and yeah. that's the idea, that yeah. it's not your memory, it's yeah. what you're living on with anyway, yeah. which is very often, in you know, false memories or yeah. things that are, are not remembered correctly or that you never understood the story correctly. In the, but that's the point. That's what everybody kind of has. It's really, difficult so. when they're things shared with other people, though. Well, that's why it's better if people don't really know who the songs yes, are about, because then they'd start saying, "Oh wait, no, it's not what happened." Yes, so, that's know, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or that's not uh, what he was like, you know. And that's the point. Mm. That's that's not really the point mm-hmm. of it. The point is that it's my, um, you know, yeah, what, fallible what's, what's lived recollections on, yeah. and so forth. And um, which is what's, you know. <coughs> that's the good thing about music too. It's so ambiguous in a way that you can uh, deal with, you know, uh, quite uh, ephemeral and. Uh, uh, feelings like they touch them lightly rather than writing well you just can infer them yeah. you know and um, also just <clears throat> stories I think uh, there's uh, sort of understood that in song form a story doesn't have to be uh, a perfect yeah. recollection or a perfect 
rendition of mm. the story. You know, it can, it can just be uh, appropriated and made to fit what yeah. you need. So there's a kind of history of that with song anyway. So You can uh, take a lot of artistic licence, I guess. Uh, yeah. Mm. And Perhaps, I hope so. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I certainly have. <clears throat> Sorry. I've read some interviews with you for the album and, and you're at... Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> often saying that y- you've never been a songwriter. You know, you never a singer songwriter like uh, sweating out over like you Dave. twenty songs a year <laughs> or something. And you say you've only written more or less this album. You know, in yeah. That I mean, way. I, th- I think prior to to actually <clears throat> undertaking this project, I'd probably written. You know, I'd write about one song every couple of years. I mean, mm. I write a lot of music, but I don't. I mean, being a songwriter requires you writing lyrics you yeah. know and I, I write music for other people's songs i've done a lot of that i'm used to working in the form mm. and i'm used to working with some pretty good lyricists too right. so that probably helped me write something half decent right. or at least kind of you know push myself to uh make the lyrics you know so when when did you know it was time possible. to put out your own record when did you feel like you know like, that you um were confident in the 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 songs that it's timed for me oh yeah look on a record. I, I think i kind of knew if i wrote about 15 or 16 that there'd probably be if there if there weren't, weren't a good album there yet then i'd better just drop it right. so yeah. <laughs> or you know write another 10 and no, i wouldn't have worked so um and you know i just got feedback you have to get some kind of outside feedback really at a point like with a, with a project like that i think anyway whether you've just overstepped the mark or right. you know is this okay mm. to do this kind of thing? Because it's a bit, it's a risky one, and it's a difficult album. I think the material's kind of difficult. I, I didn't wasn't intended to be easy. So. <clears throat> and um, who, who does that with you? Like, uh, is your partner Katie? Or, Katie, yeah, yeah. Well, I ran the songs mm. by her, of course, and I actually sent them to Polly mm. and um, got feedback from her and Daniel Miller mm-hmm. at Mute. That's that's about it, really. They're the only people I think on the record, and right. I suppose that's why because they were the ones who actually gave me that feedback. Mm. It's important to have that that kind of uh, thing. Yeah. yeah, otherwise you really, you know, it's very hard to get an objective insight into what you're doing. <clears throat> mm. And it um, can also, you know, it's a bit challenging sometimes too. You kind of go, oh, oh, is it like that? Oh dear. Mm. You know, it's important to hear that from people you trust. Because we're kind of explaining to people, I guess, the last, <clears throat> the albums you've done are the, like the two translations of Serge Gainsbourg albums mm. and your film music albums. You did a, a single for uh, Bang Records uh, as well, Kick the Drugs. Yep. And, uh, was that like a run up to this album or? No, I, th- I, no, I think the other, thing? I think uh, probably, you know, the last two albums, the. Um, one Man's Treasure and yeah. Two of Diamonds <clears throat> might play much more into the uh, the thinking behind the songs on this album. Right, yeah. And I think that it, it was very easy to choose the other songs to play live with this material because they were actually, I found when I went back and looked at them and which ones would fit that there were a whole host of, you know, a large mm. number of songs that actually fitted with the theme. They were actually, um, kind of, they were in keeping with the theme of this album. Mm. So I'd already... I suppose in my song selection for those albums, been thinking about that 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 kind of thing and choosing mm-hmm. songs that have sort of referred atmospherically and lyrically to the themes I've picked up on this album. Right. So it's quite easy to ch- choose the the rest of the set. Very uh, heavy theme to dive into. Oh. For you. Well, you know, it's just there. Yeah. <laughs> We might hear another track, actually. I don't know. You know, I, I find it pretty depressing listening to kind of flippant love songs. Right. Per, per, I, I find that really heavy. That's a really heavy <laughs> duty going. What's all that about? That's true, yes. So, right. you know, following Mark Stewart's lead mm. there, I saw a great thing with Mark Stewart mm. talking about that. Yeah. Um, you know, it was brilliant. I'll talk about that after you've played something. Like well, that. Well, let's choose a song from... Uh, from the album we only just received it from your hands oh, before truth. mix so you're, you're free to uh drive it whichever way drive you uh, you want to i'll just play track two then track two <laughs> which is the ballad of jay given no that'll, that'll be do you want to, uh, as people are hearing it can you uh, explain how you uh your recording process because you you do a lot in your own studio and you start things all by yourself yeah yeah and, and how, how well, I mean, with this that, like? with this album, I re- that was really just uh, 
kind of demoing them or yeah. doing the sketches of them, if yeah. you like. And so, which is why I ended up with that title in a way, because I was working with a rough tape that had sketches for the Book of the Dead written on it. But and it seemed to be a much more appropriate title as time went by. But then I took all the songs into Atlantis and just uh, with Rosie and we just recorded them all in two days, mm-hmm. just as basic tracks with playing together, which is, you know, I like I like it when people play music together, Dave. Yeah. You get a very special But it's often very, very, of very difficult if you start uh, things off on a guitar or a bass to, to then get a groove happening with the drums and that. Well, there weren't any drums. Right, yeah. <laughs> no drummer, no drama, you know what they say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. there, were, there was no no drums on the basic tracks. Right, it was yeah. just me and Rosie and yeah. we made our own. We kind of got the feel of playing together. and all So all the basic tracks went down like that. Yeah, but the, you've worked out this way of recording and doing things over many years, like the uh, Lanita Lane album you kind of pulled together. Well, I mean, there's a lot of different album. approaches, you know. Yeah. I mean, the, the Anita Lane stuff, most of that was done from loops that we put together. Mm-hmm that we, I then played over. You know, there's... there's. I love playing with full bands. Most mm. of the bands I'm in, and even, even the recent PJ Harvey album, was everyone playing together in the studio. Like, mm. so the basic track went down with everyone there kind of mm. playing and getting the feel for the song. And the, the Bad Seas have always recorded like that, really. Mm-hmm. And there's a few, in, you know, individual exceptions on certain albums where they've been built from one instrument up or from a little you know from a loop or something but 90 percent of the time the bad seeds record live in the studio with everyone playing Mm -hmm. and it's just the way i've always done it really that's the Mm. main way i record so So which is the song we're going to listen to uh ballad of jay givens okay here we go We're here on BLB with Mick Harvey, who's uh, launching his album, Sketches from the Book of the Dead, which is available on EMI, Mute, EMI, and uh, at the Toff in Town on Saturday. And a, uh, and a little one at the uh, Pure Pop on Thursday night, Pure too. Pure Pop. I think there's a few tickets left for the Pure Pop one. In St Kilda. And uh, that we just heard a song called The Ballad of Jay Givens, and... Um, that's track two from the album. We're going through it in numerical order, Mick. And well, you asked me which track to play, and I just said, oh, well, track two then. Yes. You know, they're all good, Dave. <laughs> yeah, so this is all recorded in Melbourne last year. Yeah, with, late uh, last year, yeah. Yes. And uh, you've been playing around with Rosie Westbrook on bass, and uh, what do you, do you just play electric guitar or acoustic guitar? Or At those kinds of dates you just did out, no, of, just, out of Melbourne? Just keep it easy, you know. Yeah. Just, stick with one guitar all yeah. night. I like yeah. it that way. Yeah. It's not too much changing around, you know. I know. So I, I know. kind of split yeah. it and run it through some effects and stuff so I can make it sound quite <coughs> electrified and distorted if I want to, and which uh, I don't do very much. And, and you're coming from doing your own shows and in between doing massive festivals as with uh, PJ Harvey? Well, just one festival. One and festival. But a lot of, our, a lot of shows with <coughs> Polly and... Theatre um, shows, in sort yeah. Of theaters and... yeah. You know, Larger venues, yeah. It must be very enjoyable experiencing those different kind of. Uh, uh, yeah, no, it's it's good. I mean, the festivals are always a bit uh, a bit of a lottery, but uh, you, you can't have the attention to detail of your music. No, you just kind things. of suddenly flung on and kind of deal with <laughs> the situation you're in, and you know, if it sounds terrible, then there's not much you can do about it, you know. So that's that kind of thing. But I mean, they can also be good, but. And you're playing bass with uh, PJ Harvey? No, I'm, I'm mostly playing a, a Rhodes piano. Really? <laughs> Excellent. You, you've worked with her across <coughs> quite a few you, Elizabeth albums. Saw, yeah, Elizabeth saw. Elizabeth saw the show. The, what was I playing, Elizabeth? Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Gee whiz, what were you playing? <laughs> um, Not much bass. Bass in a few songs, I yeah. think. No, it was uh, a great performance at Coachella. And um, you've worked with her over a few albums now, Mick. And is it is it the case where, because her albums are quite different from each other, um, that's what's so exciting, I guess, about her as an artist. Is it a, is it a case where you walk in to work with her again and you sort of think, wow, I wonder what she's got up her sleeve this time? Well, I mean, she always sends me her demos, so I have a fairly good idea of what what's coming. You know, and she will, you know, be communicating with me about what, she, what type of thing she's thinking of doing. Mm. So I have a pretty good idea of what's... What's coming? I mean, it's pretty much why I didn't work on the last two albums because um, I could see that I'd be sitting around 
all week waiting to be asked to play something one afternoon and, you know, sitting in some remote location for mm. weeks and weeks, not doing very much. Um, so I, I chose to not be away from home and my family doing practically nothing at all and to be at home instead. But uh, the, the recent album was, it was obviously going to be an all, a full-on kind of involvement and because of the way it was discussed and you know and I'd heard all the demo I've got I've got you know bucket loads of demos from Polly so mm. and has she had quite an impact on the music that you write not not that I write particularly I don't think I sort of keep finding the same chords I've always been finding. You know what it's like, Dave. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yes. Like, you know, I kind of, I, the, the musical kind of things that I keep reaching for or, or the solutions I keep finding I kind of still come pretty much from within myself, I think. But then they're, they're similar to, sometimes they're similar. People find similar solutions. Well, along those lines, I remember talking to you, uh, must have been while you were doing this album, and and you were saying there's a piece of music uh, that goes back to the boys next door period. You were kind of uh, pulling out. Uh, did, did that make it to this album? Oh, um, uh, a song oh, going what would that back. Been? <clears throat> things you'd you'd written. Oh, there, um, oh, I don't know if it goes back that far. I can think mm. of one that I wrote in about '87 that mm -hmm. I still haven't used. Yet. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Is that what you mean by? <laughs> Um, no, no. I think you just. Go back I think to the just, same things. Or? I think you go back to um, the same kind of chords, mm -hmm. and the same kind of uh, transitions, right. because they're, they're just the ones that you like in your personal <clears throat> taste. I'm getting a text. Here. There you go, Dave. It's another critic. Another critic, yeah. another critic going. Why don't you shut up? <laughs> <laughs> but that's. I mean, that for instance is how. Um, I, I, you know, it's an odd kind of sideline. But for mm -hmm. instance, I remember we would once I was in with Nick doing. Uh, we were, I don't know, we were demoing, demoing stuff mm. while we were mixing uh, that Live Seeds album. Or something. Mm. And um, and uh, Nick just got sick of kind of his hands mm. landing on the same chords and said, I'll play something in a key I don't know. Yeah. And so I just started playing something in B yeah. minor, which um, <clears throat> and uh, it sort of eventually that became Red Right Hand. All right, yeah. Mm. Which is why it's in B. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very, I think it was originally... Um, Oh, anyway, there's a longer story about yeah. that, but that's not the point. The point is mm. you tend, you know, Nick just, for instance, keeps going to C minor, yeah. E flats. He kind of goes through <clears> the same, <throat> he finds the same shapes on the piano and goes through similar transitions. Mm. And mm. I, I have a similar thing with guitar, I kind of find. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're just the, 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 the intervals and the transitions that you like. Yes. That your taste. So, you know, no, not particularly. You know, she hasn't specifically influenced me. But then some of my music's influenced her, so that's okay. It's all kind of, it's all like a, you know, she's a big fan of the early Bad Seeds albums. So, you know, it all kind of goes around, doesn't it, Dave? It does, well, yes. I've been influenced by Dave, too. <laughs> Must be that major seventh chord. But, it's uh, not the major seventh chord, Dave. But how is it's, it? <laughs> it's some other stuff in there as well. How has it been going around with this album, Mick, like uh, doing uh, press and that kinds of things and... Do you, are you sometimes surprised by what people, you know, assume or think about you in, in the media? And, uh, do, for instance, do people think you're angry or...? Um, no, I, I don't really... Uh, <clears throat> I don't really know, mm. no. I, I think, uh, well, I'm not sure. No, mm. I really don't know. Mm. But do people uh, ask you about certain periods or... Or are people wanting you to, to say uh, negative things about, you know, uh, your exit from the bad Look, seeds, Look, I, su I suppose uh, usually by the end, <coughs> late in the interview, they usually mm. leave it till late in the interview right. and they try and broach the subject yeah. of my leaving oh, the bad that's seeds. that's what we were going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's sort of what Dave's doing now. But um, no, <laughs> indirectly, no, no. no I, I didn't. But it is, uh, yeah, that's one thing that, comes up and they are um i was just curious about what what people what, what if you've confronted a persona of yourself that you didn't know was was, um, was around uh i think they think i'm <clears throat> going to be quite grouchy <laughs> <laughs> and if they ask stupid questions i probably am but other <laughs> apart apart from that no not really i, I just you know yeah just kind of chat away I, I don't mind talking right yeah you know i'm a bit of a talker i've found out 
I can't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Play some music. I, I, was just, I was just curious. Yeah. Why don't we hear another song from the album? I'll pick uh, Elizabeth always says that the track five or six is her, or is it track no, eight? Eight. eight? The bells never rang. What's that going to be? The weak one? <clears throat> no, the best no, one on the album. No, that's not the best one on the album. Really? really? No. no. I always think five or six is quite good. But uh, we oh, well. can, play, which, play, which play five. Play, play, five. play track <clears throat> five. Which that's is a very moody one. Frankie G and Frankie Fra- T and Frankie, Frankie T C. and Frankie C. Here we go. Triple, triple, ah. Ah. We just heard from Frankie T and Frankie C from Mick Harvey's album Sketches of the Book of the Dead. Now, uh, you're launching the album at the Toff in town on um, Saturday night, Mick, with a full band. Do you know the Toff in town? They have a big Pro Tools studio upstairs. You can record the night. I didn't, I didn't know that, day. I think you can, yes. No. Uh, but uh, it's not, I'm not actually <coughs> playing really with a full band. I'm just, oh, most right, of yeah. the night is just me and Rosie and okay. JP kind of noodling in yeah. the corner. Yeah. And, and who's, then, who's supporting? Uh, celery. <coughs> <laughs> celery. Mm. That's Violetta. Okay. Who's uh, doing the support. Yes. And um, that's apparently great. I still haven't seen her. The reason I put her on is because I always fail to get to her shows. <coughs> thought it was some way that I'd finally get to see what she's doing. <laughs> and uh, you're also doing a show, like you said, at the uh, Pure Pop on Thursday night. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's uh, Pure Pop is one of the few venues south of the River Mick. As a, oh, uh, really? We had a fella, <clears throat> as well as Nick came in on the show, and he had to use a GPS to get to this side of town because he was so unfamiliar with it. And, he got uh, mixed up with the numbering on Nicholson <coughs> Street because yes. it changes. Mm. And, oh, uh, terrible. But he, he, he would need a GPS to get around Elston. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a fella from the Dingoes came in and he was equally lost this side of town. Mm-hmm. I, I want to ask you uh, to reflect on this, please, Mick. What the uh, well, I know way around the south yeah. of the river used to be the musical uh, part of... Uh, well, the Prince of Wales is still going, isn't it? Yes, that's true, yes. Pure pop. Proving Isn't there wrong. the Eliabird Bird Lounge or Eliabird something? Eliabird oh, yeah. Lounge, yes. Yes. Oh, Proving me wrong here. Man, it's <laughs> happening down there. <laughs> but, uh, uh, <coughs> what oh, else yes, is there? There's the St Kilda Bowling Club, occasional good gigs there as well. That's a oh. bit of old time St Kilda mm-hmm. weirdness. Got the Community Cup coming up, which will have <coughs> some bands playing. Yes, with a Nick Cave theme. <coughs> I don't think Nick's been told that he's involved with football there. Well, so. I think he has been, really? actually, yeah. Oh. Um, it was definitely was sent through to him, and he just would have waved his hand. He's not keen on the our indigenous sport, though. Well, he just—it's uh, <clears throat> not no, nothing to do with that. He mm. just simply has just doesn't understand sport right. at all. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's just meaningless to him. He used to enjoy wrestling, though. At some period, <laughs> I remember in the nineties, he was always wrestling with people. And part of being in the bad seeds was, you know, being. Having Mick dive on you wrestling occasionally. Okay, well, I, I know that he uh, he rugby tackled mm. Michael Gdinsky, <laughs> uh, famously upstairs at the Sydney <coughs> Uni refectory, and uh, mm. it's quite exciting. <laughs> yeah. That was about as close as he got to sport, rugby, <laughs> rugby tackling Michael Gdinsky. Yeah. A feat which Matt Crosby repeated in Tokyo, um, <coughs> inspired by the story about 20 mm. years later. Yes. Now... Uh, <laughs> Dave doesn't want to talk. Is he your record company boss? Uh, no, no. Uh, well, he, he might be. Actually, actually I think yes. he is. Yeah. Uh, uh, changing the subject, yes. okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I did hear about a mutual friend who is, has a manager who is not allowed within that building. <laughs> <laughs> you really? So this is one avenue for the uh, band that's been cut off. Anyway, uh, we're talking about your album sketches uh, from the Book of the Dead. There's a beautiful cover here, Mick. It's, it's quite a... Uh, is it a watercolour painting? No, it's uh, an oil painting. Oil Dave. painting. It's, beautiful. It's, uh, it's by a, a German... Uh, Australian artist really? who painted in the 1930s called Gustav Pillig. Mm-hmm. He also did these ceilings at the Regent Theatre mm-hmm. and um, I think downstairs in whatever that ballroom is downstairs he did, oh, all, yeah. the, mm-hmm. that beautiful did all the ballroom. frescoes and stuff down there mm-hmm. and a lot of paintings. He had a studio in North Melbourne. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful <clears throat> picture of uh, kind of um, 
gum trees. Well, it's a very uh, rural. It's a very uh, you know um, atmospheric depiction of an Australian mm-hmm. uh, scene there, and uh, a German a rustic scene. German Australian kind of um, nexus has been there since you know the explorer Leichhardt wandered madly into the desert in Australia. You've known it's, a it's few. It's continued. Oh, well, there's quite mm. a bit of it. What is it? Hans Heysen, is it? <coughs> has probably South predated this chap as a South German... Australian uh, watercolour man. Uh, beautiful Australian artworks that he <coughs> created. And you play with all those uh, mad Germans and... I play with a lot of Germans, mm, yeah. That's true, yes. <laughs> and the <laughs> Blixer Bar Guild and Tomas yeah. Weidler. What's Thomas up to recently? Well, Thomas, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what Tommy's been mm. doing. Waiting for the bad seeds to reconvene, I think. But he, he he will be joining from me for my shows in Berlin in Cologne in about a month. He did some brilliant shows out here playing his instrumental music. He did, which, and we're still trying to. Uh, people are still trying to encourage him to get out there and mm. present that uh, in Europe a bit more properly. That um, was yourself and Rosie Westbrook again, James Johnson, who was in the Bad yeah, Seeds. Jalitha. Team, Jalitha Ryan. And uh, it was brilliant. And Claire. Claire Moore on Vibes. On Vibes. Brilliant uh, instrumental music. No Vibes, No <coughs> Vibe. That's right, yes. <laughs> mm. That's, that's, you've made up with Claire there Someone's after like. your No Drummer, No Drama <laughs> crack. Yeah, no, well. <clears throat> that's that was a very good political move there. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I thought I'd, I had to make it. Yeah. I had to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, James Johnson is also coming out to Australia in a while. He plays with He's Faust. He's playing with Faust. Mm. That'll be exciting. Well, mm. you know, James was in my live band for a while mm. and he... he He's, he's ended up playing with Faust mm. and they'll be here for the... Is it just the Melbourne Festival? I think it's part of the Jazz Festival. And I completely having, miss him. Yeah. I, I'm actually mm. in London mm-hmm. when he gets here. I'm looking forward so to So he can't come that. to my show. I'd actually said, uh, invited him to sit in and play on a few songs, mm. but he's playing with Faust. Some, <laughs> I'm sure it's during the Jazz Festival. It's the Jazz Festival. You're quite right, Dave. <clears throat> and... Um, it's a part of the uh, wide community of musicians you're a part of, Mick. It's very, uh, very uh, thrilling, like I said, how you can uh, go from playing with uh, PJ Harvey in theatres and uh, the Coachella festivals, playing your own music and then um, working in film soundtracks as well. <clears throat> well, it's exciting for me. Mm, mm. It's, uh, it's really, it's, uh, it's, it's great. You know, I, I enjoy all of those things. Mm. So, have you been just as busy since you left the Bad Seeds as you were when you were in them? Um, in the last few months, yeah. But uh, not uh, apart from the last few months, no. It's been a lot more open and a lot more free time, mm-hmm. a lot more home time, which is part of the idea as well. It's part of the reason I had to kind of uh, mm. call time on that. Because I was so busy and then I couldn't fit my own things in and I was just hectic constantly. So it was one of the reasons. Did it feel like a big relief when you left the band or was it sort of bittersweet? Um, Well, it was a mixture of all those things at the time because, you know, there was obviously a bit of friction and some odd odd things going on as well. But um, uh, really uh, after about a month or two, it was just a relief really, yeah. Once I realised it was actually... Uh, working out and I was uh, mm-hmm. sitting at home enjoying myself and the phone calls weren't coming in at midnight anymore. It was like, yeah, it was the right decision. Mm-hmm. So it was quite a relief, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was a massive, I mean, it's just like a, a massive relationship in your life sort of coming to well, an end. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it was probably reached a saturation point that I was glad to kind of get away from. Sure. So, um, you know, not, not that that's just, um, it's just I don't know, the way it worked out, so... It was a very long term thing, but you know, I probably need a few, a little bit more time off it to start kind of missing it or something. Are you going to write a book? Ooh, straight to the point. I like <laughs> it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll have to, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I mean, it would be, you could write, I don't know, I hope, well, I've certainly thought about it. Be good fun. I mean, I would try and write a really fun book, mm-hmm. you know, that was really just very entertaining. Mm-hmm. All the entertaining stuff. Well, that's uh, all people want to read anyway. So there's a lot of uh, funny anecdotes and stories back there. I'm, I'm sure it would be of great interest to people, you know, the... Uh, Nick's the, lawyers. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a long, uh... I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be, you know, 
I wouldn't be libeling anyone. Yeah. It's in a way, you know... Knowingly. <laughs> the, the music scene you come from and you've worked in was uh, strangely still very, very interesting to hear people talk about it because in some ways coming from Melbourne, in inner city Melbourne or uh, kind of underworld scene that was... Uh, Quite, connect, quite focused internationally, you know, as, as opposed to the pub rock culture that was around it. I'm talking about in 1978 or mm-hmm. 79. It was a very interesting dynamic, you know. One group of people leapt into the future. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <clears throat> and around... The others came kicking and screaming a little bit later mm. on, kind of got dragged into it in the 80s, yeah. And that strange but, uh, period you would have experienced b- b- before Nirvana when all those acts like American, English, Australian were touring around Europe, uh, mm-hmm. Sonic Youth and the Gun yeah, Club yeah, and yeah. that. Late 80s, mm. yeah. It was a very interesting period. It was, that was fascinating. I was, I was living, obviously, in Berlin at that time, and you'd just see the posters you know, if you travelled or if we travelled around playing in Europe, you'd just see the posters and every second band had Oz mm. next to it, you know. Mm-hmm. They're just, just amazing. Or yeah. USA, you know, it's just like you say, it was like that. It was a very big, strong live scene in Europe with, with touring bands and, and some it was of quite the, healthy too, actually. And, and some of the American ones were so shocking to the London media because they were out of their control. Oh, like, yeah, oh, they wouldn't have liked that. But by, yeah. the, by that stage, I was living in Berlin, so mm. I didn't have to put up with reading any of that rubbish. Yeah, <laughs> like the butthole surfers appearing oh, in the yeah, UK. Oh, great, they, they love them, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they were quite, quite, quite out of control people. And uh, Yeah, I remember meeting them backstage at a show in Hamburg. We were playing this all-day festival with about six bands. Mm. It was an absolute disaster called Kings of Independence. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think Crime played, and then uh, they were meant to be on sometime. And uh, The Swans and... Oh, I can't remember. It was more The Bad Seeds, eventually. There mm. were a couple of other bands on there, too. You exper- the Fall. You and, experienced uh, something. It was hilarious, and, but I just went and met them. They yeah. were just all sitting there being really polite and having yeah. a nice time. You know? <laughs> yeah. They were all really polite to me and said, Mick, hurry. Blah, blah, blah. And just, and I was like, I was expelled. So I think I'd been sent in there to try and convince them to have themselves videoed. They were refusing mm. to be videoed at the show. Mm. And so I kind of went in there and said, oh, look, they've sent me in there here to ask you to consider, you know, doing the video, but I don't give a damn. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Why would I care? Yeah. They no, were just like, uh, they were just really nice. But he's, yeah, he's a bit notorious, Gibby, mm. but... And what about, uh, I remember telling, uh, talking to you about there was uh, that phenomenon when a group would come to London and the media would all line up and they would be very expectant and, and it's almost they'd have to audition for the British media. And one was James White and the Blacks, the oh, contortions who, who, had, who were from New York and they were like nothing else happening in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this it, was like in the mid-80s. Mm, they played a show at the venue, yeah. Mm. Big show, sold out. London was waiting yep, for yep. them. And then then terrible uh, thing happened. Um, his partner... His partner died a week before the show, mm. and then he arrived in London and the band all weren't allowed in. Mm. But he did the show anyway with people like Keith Levine and just all these... London. London musos kind of filling in, not even knowing Susie the material. And the just all these people who just didn't even know. That was just bizarre. I went to both concerts actually because mm. he <clears throat> he did the first one. It was sold out, and everyone was like, mm. and it was just this weird kind of mess. Yeah, and because uh, they were quite tightly drilled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. he got he got his proper band in, and they did the the subsequent show mm. three or four weeks later, and there were like three hundred people there, mm. and they were amazing. Right. <laughs> Oh, that was but, good. They did a good show. He still plays around Europe. Yeah, but it was all yeah. over for him. You know? Yes, yeah. That he'd moment. failed the, <laughs> yeah, he'd failed the audition. Mm. Mm. <laughs> it all went bad on him. Poor mm. old, poor old James. Yeah, <clears throat> he's he's a terrifically influential performer, though. Yeah, yeah, very mm. much so. It's about seven minutes to two here on Banana Lounge yes. Broadcasting. We've been talking for the last hour to Mick Harvey about his new record, Sketches from the Book of the Dead, which is being launched at the TOF this Saturday night. There are still tickets available for that show, aren't there, Mick? Oh, I guess probably, yeah. And also at Pure Pop, and there's um, just a couple of there's tickets. There's a few tickets left, mm. left there. for that. I think That's you have to go Thursday. to their website or something. Mm. Sure. Yes. 
Anyway, purepop.com.au, mm. whatever it is. Thanks for coming on the show today, Nick. It's a Nick. pleasure. And we might... Uh, Play whatever you like. We've got time for another one. Let me mm. see what, how long track eight goes for. Oh, it's a bit long, Mick. Oh. Mm. Me- try try oh, track try seven. try track eleven. Play the play the finale. Okay. <laughs> I can Here leave. Here we go. Two thirty five. Excellent. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Thanks, mate. It's a pleasure. We all get the same amount of ice.